And if you go to Pune, on his tomb, on his samadhi, it is mentioned. Oh, show. Never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December, 1931, to the 19th of January, 1990. They forgot to mention on the tomb that he was not granted visas to anyone different countries of the world. Imagine Almighty God requiring visas to travel to different countries of the world. And the Archbishop of Greece said that if you do not throw Rajneesh out of the country, we shall burn his house as well as the house of his disciples. And the last test is so stringent that it does not befit anyone but the true Almighty God. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, He is not God. And there is nothing like unto Him. We know Bhagwan Rajneesh, He had two eyes, a nose, two ears, and a mouth. He had a white beard and he wore a white robe. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, He is not God. And there is nothing like unto Him. For example, if someone says that Almighty God, He is a thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger. You might have heard the person Arnold Schwarzenegger. The person who won the title, Mr. Universe, the strongest man in the world, the strongest man in the universe. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, He is not God. And there is nothing like unto Him. Whether it be Arnold Schwarzenegger, or whether it be King Kong, or whether it be Dara Singh, the moment you can compare God to anything in this world, He is not God. And there is nothing like unto him. So this Surah Ikhlas is the touchstone of theology. I would request the brothers and sisters out here that the God which you are worshipping put him to the test of Surah Ikhlas. And if he passes the test, then the God which you are worshipping is a true God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 110. Say call upon him by Allah or call him by Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, to him belong the most beautiful names. And there are no less than 99 different names given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Hakim. Most gracious, most merciful, most wise. But the crowning one is Allah. Why do we Muslims prefer calling Allah with the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God? Because a person can play mischief with the English word God. For example, if we add S to God, so it becomes gods, that is the plural of God. There is nothing like the plural of Allah. Qul huwallahu ahad. Say he is Allah, the one and only. If we add D-E-S-S to God, so it becomes goddess, that is female God. There is nothing like female Allah or male Allah in Islam. If we add mother to God, so it becomes God mother. There is nothing like Allah mother or Allah means Islam. If we add father to God, so it becomes Godfather. He is my Godfather. He is my guardian. There is nothing like Allah Father or Allah by Islam. That's the reason we Muslims prefer calling Allah with the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God. And many people say that if Almighty God, He can do anything and everything, then why can't He become a human being? If Almighty God becomes a human being, then He ceases to be God. Because the qualities of Almighty God and human beings are opposite. Human beings, we are mortal. Almighty God is immortal. You cannot have a mortal and immortal person at the same time. Human beings, we've got a beginning. 
Almighty God, he's got no beginning. You cannot have a person with no beginning and beginning at the same time. Human beings, we've got an end. Almighty God, he's got no end. You cannot have a person with an end and no end at the same time. It's meaningless. It's like you telling me, I saw a tall short man. Either you can see a tall man or a short man or a medium man. You cannot see a tall, short man. We human beings, we require to eat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 14, wa huwa yuta'imu wa la yuta'am. And he feeds, but he is not fed. We human beings, we require to rest. We require to sleep. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 255. The Ayat al-Kursi. Allah la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum la ta'quduhu sinatu wa la nawm Allah, there's no God besides him no slumber can seize him nor does he require to sleep we human beings, we require to sleep we require to rest and if you go a step further that if Almighty God can do anything and everything that Almighty God, he can even lie he can even make a mistake he can even forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 52. La yudillu rabbi wa la yansa. My Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he never forgets. And if you go a step further, that Almighty God, he can even do injustice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 40. Inna Allah la yadhlimu misqala dharra. Allah does not commit injustice even in the least bit. Nowhere in the glorious Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he can do anything and everything. What does he say? Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadeer. For verily, Allah hath power over all things. In several places, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse 106, in Surah Baqarah, Chapter number 2, verse number 109. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 284. In Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 29. In Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 77. And in Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 1. Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. For verily, Allah hath power over all things. So nowhere in the glorious Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that. He can do anything and everything. What does he say? Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. For verily, Allah has power over all things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 18. Summum bukmun amyun fahum la yirajaun. The deaf, the dumb, the blind, they will never return. And a similar message is mentioned in the Bible. It is mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 13, verse number 13. Seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Same thing in the Hindu scriptures. It is mentioned in Rigved, book number 10, hymn number 71, mantra number 4. Some see the word, yet they see it not. Others hear the word, yet they hear it not. So all these scriptures, they are explicitly mentioning that you have to worship only one God. Yet, there are some people who behave like deaf, dumb and blind and do not follow the message. Most of the religions, they directly or indirectly believe in the philosophy of anthropomorphism, except for Islam. And that is, Almighty God, He becomes a human being. And they give a very good logic. They say that, you know, Almighty God, He is so pure, He's so holy, he does not know the shortcomings of a human being. So he has to become a human being to know what's good and bad for the human being. On the face of it, it's a very good logic. But for example, if I manufacture a DVD player, I do not have to become a DVD player to know what's good and bad for the DVD player. What do I do? I write an instructional manual. If you want to play the disc, put the disc in, and press the play button. If you want to do fast forward, press the FF button. Don't drop it from a height, it will get damaged. Don't immerse it in water, it will get spoiled. 
I write an instructional manual. I not have to become a DVD player to know what's good and bad for the DVD player. Therefore, the last and final revelation for us human beings, it is the glorious Quran. The do's and don'ts are mentioned. So Almighty God need not become a human being. He reveals an instructional manual and he chooses a man amongst men and communicates with him at a higher level through the form of revelation. So Almighty God need not become a human being. Islam, besides catering to the spiritual aspects, it even caters to the other aspects of life. <laughs> the religions basically tell people to do good things for example all the religions say that robbing is bad raping is bad molesting a woman is bad Hinduism says that Christianity says that Islam says that so what's the difference Islam besides saying that all this is bad it shows us a state in which all this can be prevented in Islam there is a system of zakat. Every rich man who has a saving of more than the nisab level, he should give 2.5% of a saving every lunar year in charity. If every rich man gives charity, poverty will eradicate from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. And after that, if any man robs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 38. As-sariq wa as-sariqatu faqtau wa aydiyahuma jaza'an bima kasaba nakalam min Allah. As for the thief, whether it be male or female, chop off their hands as a punishment from the Lord for their crime. And in Saudi Arabia, this law is implemented. Some people might say that if you go in Saudi Arabia, every second person's hand you would find it chopped off. The punishment, the law, it is so strict that a person would think a ten times before doing the crime. And many people say that chopping off the hands in this 21st century, Islam is a barbaric religion. Islam is a ruthless religion. You know, America, happening to be one of the most advanced countries of the world, it has one of the highest rate of crime in the world. I'm asking the question that if you implement the Islamic Sharia in USA, that every rich man, he should give zakah. And after that, if any man robs, chopping off the hands, I'm asking the question that will the rate of crime and theft in America, will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? But naturally it will decrease. You implement the Sharia and you get results. Therefore, the least rate of crime and theft in any country in the world, it's in Saudi Arabia. You implement the Sharia and you get results. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Noor, chapter number 24, verse number 30. Kull mu'minina ya'uddu min absari wa ya'fadu furujahum. Say to the believing man, that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Whenever any man looks at any woman, if any blazing thought, if any unashamed thought comes to his mind, he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Next verse, Surah Noor, chapter number 24, verse number 31. Allah says, Say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty and display not her beauty except what is ordinary of and tell her to draw her veil over her bosoms and display not her beauty except in front of their husbands their fathers their sons and there's a big list of mehrams of close relatives who she cannot marry in Islam there are basically six criteria for hijab that I mentioned the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith the first is the extent for the man and for the woman. For the man, it is from the navel till the knee. And for the woman, it is the complete body should be covered. 
The only parts that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. The remaining five criteria are same for the man and for the woman. Second, the clothes they wear, it should be loose. It should not be tight fitting. It should not reveal the figure. Third, it should not be translucent or transparent. Fourth, that it should not be so glamorous that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not be that of the opposite sex. And the sixth is that it should not resemble that of the unbelievers. So these are basically six criteria for hijab that I mentioned in the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the glorious Quran in Surah Azab chapter number 33 verse number 59. Ya ayyuhan nabiyu, قُلْ لِأَزْوَاجِكَ وَبَنَاتِكَ وَنِسَاءِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ O Prophet, tell your wives and your daughters that when they go abroad, to put on their cloak so that it will prevent them from being molested. I would like to give you an example. If there are twin sisters who are walking down the streets of Maldives and if there's a hooligan who's waiting for a catch and one is dressed in the hijab, that is the complete body is covered, and the other is dressed in the mini skirts or shorts, and they are equally beautiful. And if there's a hooligan who's waiting for a catch, who's waiting to tease a girl, I am asking the question that which girl will he tease? Will he tease the girl in the mini skirts or shorts, or will he tease the girl in the Islamic hijab? But natural, he will tease the girl in the mini skirts or shorts. If you invite, so he'll receive. And after that, if any man rapes any woman, capital penalty, death penalty. Someone might say death penalty in this 21st century. Islam is a barbaric religion. Islam is a ruthless religion. America, happening to be one of the most advanced countries in the world, it has one of the highest rate of rape. According to the FBI report, in the year 1990 alone, 1756 rapes took place every day. And according to U.S. Department of Justice, in the year 1996 alone, 2,713 women have been raped every day. 1990, 1756. 1996, 2,713. Maybe the Americans, they got bold in the span of six years. I am asking the question that if you implement the Islamic Sharia in USA, that every woman, she should wear the hijab, that the complete body should be covered. The only parts that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. And after that, if any man rapes any woman, capital penalty, death penalty, I am asking the question that will the rate of rape in America, will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? But naturally it will decrease. You implement the Sharia and you get results. Therefore, the least rate of rape in any country in the world, it's in Saudi Arabia. You implement the Sharia and you get results. Let us analyze what is the meaning of the word Jew. A Jew is a person who loves God. So by definition, I am a Jew. But if a Jew is a person who follows the Talmudic and other scriptures, then I am not a Jew. A Christian is a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. So by definition, I am a Christian. But if a Christian is a person who worships Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, then I am not a Christian. The word Hindu, geographically it refers to the people living beyond the river Sindhu. And it refers to the people living around the river Indus. So geographically, I'm a Hindu. But if a Hindu is a person who worships idols, then I'm not a Hindu. Islam comes from the root word salam, which means peace. It is also derived from the Arabic word silm, which means to submit your will to the will of God. Thus Islam means peace acquired by submitting your will to the will of God. And anyone who submits his will to the will of God, he is called as a Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 24. 
wa immin ummah illa khala fiha nadid and there is not a nation to whom you have not sent a warner or a kind allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious quran in surah rab chapter number 13 verse number 7 wa li kulli qaumin had and to each nation we have sent a guy by name 25 prophets that mention the glorious quran for example adam noah abraham moses jesus muhammad peace be upon them all by name 25 messengers that mention the glorious quran but all the messengers earlier before prophet muhammad peace be upon him they were only sent for their people but prophet muhammad peace be upon him is sent for the whole of humanity Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran in Surah Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ الْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent thee not, but as a mercy to all the worlds, as a mercy to all the creatures, as a mercy to the whole of humanity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran in Surah Raad, chapter number 13, verse number 38. لِكُلِّ أَجَلٍ كِتَابٍ and to each period, we have sent a book. By name, four revelations are mentioned in the glorious Quran. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil, and the Quran. The Torah was the Wahi, the revelation that was revealed to Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. The Zabur was the Wahi, the revelation that was revealed to Prophet David, peace be upon him. The Injil was the Wahi, the revelation that was revealed to Prophet Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And the Quran is the last and final revelation that was revealed to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And the glorious Quran, it is for the whole of humanity. It is mentioned in several places. In Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 1. In Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 52. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 185. And in Surah Zumur, chapter number 39, verse number 41. That the glorious Quran it is meant for the whole of humanity. The glorious Quran is not meant only for the Muslims, only for the Arabs, but it's meant for the whole of humanity. Wherever you are, whether it be in Maldives, whether it be in America, whether it be in India, you have to follow the last and final revelation that is the glorious Quran and the last and final messenger that is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I would like to end my talk with a quotation from the glorious Quran from Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125. And write all the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preachings and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious.